that we need to know and stand on as Christians. Now, um, the first thing that we're teaching in our, we, I call it a Christian faith series. And the first thing that we're teaching is about knowing Jesus. Because Jesus Christ is the nucleus for everything that we believe in Christianity. Everything is surrounded around Jesus. The Old Testament was surrounded around Jesus. It was hidden. His, Jesus said, if you search the scriptures, you will find that they are of me. So our things in the Old Testament were just symbolic of the reality that is in the New Testament, but it's all about Jesus. So we need to know who Jesus is, know what Jesus did, know what he represent, and be able to stand on the word of God. Um, we started on this topic about knowing Jesus, and on last Tuesday night, uh, First Lady Anderson did the teaching on the first two things that we want to talk about concerning Jesus. And then on, um, on Sunday, Minister Vandella picked up two more things. So the things that Sister Anderson talked about was the virgin birth. And it was just, it, now I looked up what the Catholics and other believe, what they call immaculate conception. And I, I, I found out after listening to that, that's not sound doctrine. Because what they were teaching is that Mary was spiritually pure, that Mary was sinless before she had Jesus, and that's not true. Mary, every, every man, that, every man, woman, boy, and child that was born of a man was born with a sin nature. Even Mary, who was the mother of Jesus. And so, but she was a virgin when Jesus Christ was born. And I told them on, on last Tuesday night, basically, science is just catching up with what God has already done because right now, a virgin can have a child. But she has to use a seed of a man. They call it artificial insemination. Yeah. They can plant the seed into a woman and she can actually have a baby without ever having a sexual relationship with a man. Well, the Holy Spirit was the doctor and he put the seed of the Holy Ghost, he put his seed, the seed of God, into that virgin and she was, she was conceived with child. And it was important that Jesus Christ be born of a virgin because he had to bypass the seed of a man. Because the seed of the man was already polluted, the seed of the man was already um, sinful, and so God bypassed the man and used his own seed to go into the virgin to produce Jesus. So that's why he was called the Son of God. And he was God manifested in the flesh. And in order for him to fulfill the assignment that God gave him, it was necessary for him to come into the world free from sin. And he is the only one. And he lived a sin-free life. As um, Minister Van brought up on Sunday in her message, that when Adam and Eve, they were created without sin. They didn't have to sin. But see, God gave them a choice, just like God gave us a choice, just like Jesus had a choice. The Bible says he was tempted on all points, just as we are, yet without sin. Well, if he wasn't tempted, then, I mean, if, if he was not capable of doing it, then he was not tempted. You can't tempt me with something that I'm capable of doing. You can't tempt me with being 10 feet tall. You can't tempt me with being six feet tall. That, that's, that's an impossibility for me. And so Jesus was tempted on all points, just as we are. And we'll see that the points of sin, are, there's only three points, lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, and the pride of life. Every sin will fall into one of those three categories. But Jesus lived his life here on earth free from sin so that he was able to pay the penalty of sin for all of mankind. Amen. So Minister Anderson taught on the virgin birth and she taught about Jesus living a sin-free life. Then on Sunday, 
Sister Vandella came and she talked about Jesus' death on the cross and what it mean to us. All of that led up, that sin-free life led up to him dying on the cross to pay for the penalty of our sin. And then not only did Jesus die on the cross, he raised himself up from the dead. Hallelujah. He is the only one that, 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 that died and arose again and is alive forevermore. Amen. Amen. All the other people that Jesus Christ raised from the dead, all those that Paul raised, Peter raised, Elijah raised, they died again. But Jesus is alive forevermore. Yeah. And his resurrection proved to us that he is who he said that he is. Amen. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man come to the Father but by me. In other words, Allah can't lead, Allah can't lead you to God. Allah is not the real God. Muhammad can't lead you to God. Buddha can't lead you to God. Confucius can't lead you to God. No other religious leader can lead you to God because Jesus said, I am the way. And Jesus proved that he was who he said he was by his resurrection. Hallelujah. Tonight we're going to start talking about Jesus Christ being the mediator. Um, the mediator between God and man. We needed somebody to stand in the gap because of our sin. I believe over in the book of Isaiah, it talked about how God's hands are not too short, his ears are not dull. He said, but your sins have separated you from your God. And so we needed somebody that was connected to humanity and connected to God in order to be a mediator. See, so Jesus was God enough that he could be, a, a, could identify with God and he was man enough that he could identify with us. So he is the only one that qualified to stand in the gap and be the mediator. Uh, our first scripture is 1 Timothy. And while I'm saying this, if anybody, I left my my tablet that I normally use with my Bible on it here at church on Sunday. And if anybody here that's listening and they found it, I would appreciate returning it to me um, because I kind of got used to that one. But I have a, a backup, and that's what this one is. 1 Timothy chapter number 2, um, verse number 5. And I'm reading from the King James Version. It said, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Jesus Christ. Yeah. There is no other way, no other way to get to God except through Jesus Christ. I, I remember growing up in church and I remember my uncle, that was my favorite uncle that, that um, I grew up around, a, 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 he married my aunt, and I used to hear him say that one day when I stand before the good master, he gonna weigh my good against my bad. And if my good outweigh my bad, he gonna let me in. That was so wrong, because we're not saved by being good. And nobody can be good enough to earn salvation. And even if you start being good, what about all that bad you did in the past? <laughs> so the only way, you, you can't come to God just by changing your mind and deciding you're going to start doing it right now. Because you still got some stuff to deal with. And even that you've already done. And even if you could start over, there's no way that you're going to live from here to the rest of your life without living and practicing some kind of sin on your own. You just can't do it. So there is one mediator between God and men, and that is the man, Jesus Christ. And Jesus made that very plain and very clear. When we come to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior in our lives, he forgives us of our sins. And when God forgives us of our sins, he cleanses us. The Bible says we confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us 
from all unrighteousness. See, when you come to Jesus, you don't leave the same way. It's not just a mind thing. It's a spirit thing. It's something that is done on the inside of you that you could not do on your own. That's why the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. All things become new. So we have a new life. We are beginning a new life when we come into Christ Jesus. And that's the only way to get to God is through Christ Jesus. All right, let's look at the book of Hebrews, chapter number, um, chapter number 8. Hebrews, chapter number 8. And we're going to begin looking at verse number 1. He says, Now the things which we have spoken, this is the song. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. See, our high priest is already right there in the, in the audience of God. Amen. He don't have to wait for a court appointed day. Right. He don't have to wait until you come at a certain time. You can come late in the midnight hour. You can come early in the morning. You can come when you're happy. You can come when you're sad. And he don't need an appointment. Amen. He is already there as our intercessor. He says, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. Hallelujah. Then it says, for every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices, wherefore it is of necessity that this man has somewhat also to offer. The Old Testament and the priest, the prophet, and the king were symbolic of what Jesus Christ is to the church. So the people did not have the right and the opportunity to just go boldly before the throne of grace like we have today because of the sin situation. The only way we can do it is because our sin has been taken care of. Because Jesus took care of the sin. See, it's the sin that blocked us. See, God's eyes are not uh, dull where he can't see, his ears not dull here, his hand not short. But the sin, we had a sin problem that was separating us from having a right relationship with God. Well, now Jesus Christ has done away with that problem, that sin problem, and we can come bold. But the people in the Old Testament, what they had to do was bring an offering to the priests. And when they brought their offering to the priests, then the priests would carry their offering to God. So that's how it operated in the natural in the Old Covenant. And so they had to have, they couldn't go before God empty. Oh, Lord. I'm going to let y'all just think about that a little while. When you come before God, you need to have something to offer. And I'm not necessarily talking about a monetary offering. You, and it does not hurt to have that too. Because whatever seed you sow, that is going to produce the harvest that you reap. But I think about sometimes when people come to the altar, and I like to be specific so when people come to me, I don't just assume that I know what to pray for. I ask them, what do you need me to pray for? What do you want me to be in agreement with you for? What do you want me to stand before God on your behalf along with you to pray for? And some people say, well, I just need prayer. Well, prayer for what? You need, to be, you need to know what it is that you want. How do you know when the prayer answers if you don't know what you pray for? All right. <laughs> so we need to find out what it is. And so it says every high priest has something to offer. So Jesus Christ himself had to have something to offer. It says, for if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law who serve unto the example and shadow 
of heavenly things. As Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle, for see, he said, that thou make all things according to the pattern shown to thee in the mountain. See, when God, when Moses spent those 40 days up in the mountain with God, and God gave him the commandments, God gave him a vision on how the temple is supposed to be built. God had a tabernacle that's supposed to be built. And the thing is, he saw the pattern that was already up in heaven. And he would take that pattern and make an example of it down here on earth. That's why in the tabernacle, they had the outer court, then they had the inner court, and then they had the Holy of Holies. See, it was, it was different parts that you would enter into, and, the, and only the priests were allowed to go into the Holy of Holies. And that the priest was, 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 was to be blamed if he was not a, a, a holy man, if he was just perpetrating, like we got a lot of ministers doing today because they got a good hoop and a good holler and they know how to do, how to stir people's emotions and they walk out and they having affairs with somebody else's wife or somebody that's not theirs. They're living a ragged life. Well, if the high priest went into the Holy of Holies and he was that kind of man, he would drop dead. They had to tie a rope around his leg so that if he dropped dead, they could pull him out because nobody could go in there and get him. And they would put bells on the bottom of his robe so they could hear him moving around so they would know he was still alive. <laughs> Hallelujah. And so that was a symbolic of the Holy of Holies. Only Jesus is required or, 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 or what's the right word? Qualified to sit right where he's sitting at the right hand of the Father. Nobody else could have. Amen. Amen. So, G, so the, the Old Testament high priest was symbolic of what Jesus is in reality. Yes. Amen. It says, but God showed Moses an example on the, on the mountain of what was going on in heaven so he could build the tabernacle the way he built it. He didn't just build it out of his own mind, out of his own concept. He was following the guideline that God gave him to build that tabernacle. It says, but now he hath obtained a more excellent ministry. Talking about Jesus. By how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. We have to realize, that's another thing, that's why, another reason why it's so important that we as Christians, we that are naming the name of Jesus Christ, we need to get a good enough understanding of who we are and the word of God so we won't get put in the bondage while we're here on earth following traditions of men. Not only following traditions of men, but also putting yourself in bondage to the Old Testament law. There are still churches today that are still trying to follow Old Testament covenant. Jesus is the mediator of a new covenant. And if you want to finish reading the rest of the chapter, in chapter number 8 in Hebrews, it lets you know that when the, old, when the new covenant came on the scene, it took the place of the old covenant. Amen. And it said, that which is old and decayed is ready to vanish away. Yeah, but we got so many churches right now they're still trying to live under the Old Covenant. They're trying to live Old Testament law, and they're trying to live New Testament grace and truth, and you cannot do them both. Amen. Praise God. But unless you know and know that you know. The Lord uh, laid it up on my heart one time, sometime last year, I believe it was, it might have been earlier this year, to do a teaching on the Old Covenant versus the New Covenant. And a man in Philadelphia, it was on YouTube, a man in Philadelphia wrote me a letter, 
And I still got the letter because it was very encouraging. And he said that cleared up a lot of things for him as far as people as the Old Testament and the New Testament, where the Old Testament stopped and the New Testament began, where the Old Covenant stopped and the New Covenant began, and God gave me revelation how I could explain the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, and he sent an offer to the church. Amen. Now that was encouraging. Philadelphia. So sometimes YouTube is good for something. Yes. Amen. Sometimes Facebook is good for something. Yes. And, and I thank the Lord for that because it reaches people beyond our scope of right here in the sanctuary. Yes. Because the word of God needs to go out. And there's a lot of people in bondage, but the word of God is designed to set you free. That's what it's designed, to set you free. Because you are in bondage when you're under the ignorance of the word of God. The devil can put you in bondage. And not only the devil, people that mean well can still put you in bondage. Amen. My wife and I were talking about when we first got saved, we got saved in what's referred to as the sanctified church, holiness church. And I still got sanctification and holiness in me. Amen. I believe you got to live holy. I believe you're supposed to live a sanctified life. I believe that. But they had some traditions and customs in that church that were putting people in bondage. They didn't even want their children that went to school to play games like basketball and baseball because the pastor said God don't play. So the, he didn't want the children to play. They told women that you can't wear pants in church because women, the Bible say, that women are not supposed to wear clothes that pertain to a man. Well, who decided that pants was for man thing or woman thing? All right. I, I, somebody might even look it up, but I think it was, was it Levi or, or somebody else that, that, that invented it. They didn't have no pants when Jesus was around. Everybody wore robes. But they probably had robes that were designed for women, robes that were designed for men. And the purpose was they didn't want a woman trying to look like a man and be a, 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 a homosexual. Homosexuality is sin. And they didn't want a woman to be looking like a man. They didn't want a man to be looking like a woman. They didn't want you to talk about I'm binary. I'm a man today and I'm a woman tomorrow. And I don't identify with that foolishness. And that system was, was brought up. So they brought it into the church. And they tell the women, you can't wear pants. And when they wore a shirt, and when it's wore it, it was supposed to be a long sleeve. They don't want your arm. What about your arms? The people can't look at your arms. See, people can put you in bondage. Yes. And they got pants designed for women. I look funny wearing some of the pants my wife wear. Amen. Amen. So you can't, you can't be brought under traditions and bondages of people because you don't know the word of God. Yes. You need to know what God said and what God did. My wife said somebody came up to her and told her you got on lipstick. You know you in a sanctified church and you got on lipstick. And she said show me in the Bible the book, the chapter, and the verse that tell me I can't wear lipstick. Yes. See you can't afford to let people put you in bondage. But they'll put you in bondage if you don't know the word of God. Yeah. See, all that came back from Jezebel. Uh -huh. Yeah, the way she had herself all made up and everything, and, and, and she was a deceiver, and, and that's where all that come from. But you ain't got to be no Jezebel to look good. Amen. And a lot of y'all need to look good. <laughs> Amen. 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 The one of y'all, and I'm not, a, I'm not a woman bashing, but if you ain't got no husband, if you want one, you need to look presentable so when a man see you, he might want you. And if you married, you need to look good for your husband so he won't be looking at everybody else. Same thing with the man. You need to cut your hair sometime. I don't know why they got it now. I'm getting off on a, on a, on a rabbit trail. But I don't know why right now the more scraggly a man look, the more women want him. Amen. They, they look so unkept. I mean, it's all right to grow a beard, but why don't you trim it? Amen. All them, all them bees and stuff flying in all kind of different directions and stuff, and, and the pants about to fall off the butt. Every, they can't hardly walk for pulling the pants up. 
I mean, <laughs> Pastor, you done got out of your business. That ain't your business, okay? All right. I ain't trying to start no new tradition or anything either. But what I'm saying is we ought to be presentable before God. Amen, amen. And, and, and we represent God, so we need to do that. Okay, let me go a little further. It says, uh, for if the, okay, he said, but now he has obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant. See, when, when Jesus on the last day, whenever he was on earth, right before Pentecost, not Pentecost, right before um, the altar, what's called the Passover, and he did the Passover, he let them know that this is a New Testament in my blood. A testament is a will. A testament is a covenant. So what Jesus Christ did, he knew that he was about to go on the cross and shed his blood and establish a new testament, a new covenant. The Old Testament was established with blood of animals. The New Testament is established by the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, yes, yes. which was based upon better promises. Yes. So we have a new covenant through Christ Jesus with better promises. Then it says, uh, verse number seven, for if the first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. Well, what was wrong with the first covenant? Yeah, Paul said that the covenant of the law was just and holy and good. But the problem was you give a just, holy, and good word to an unsaved person, unclean person, an unjust, unholy person, they can't do it. What God did was he had to change the person. And he made a covenant that we can live with based upon grace and truth, not law. Okay? So that was the problem with the first covenant. He said, for finding fault with them, with the people, he said, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And before you get thrown off, the house of Israel and the house of Judah, we're talking spiritually because the Bible says that we become spiritual Jews. We are grafted in to the family. Read the 11th chapter of Romans. We are grafted in to that original tree. We are spiritual Jews. We are spiritual Israel. Once we receive Jesus Christ, and that brings us under the new covenant. Yeah. All right, my time is up. Um, good Lord, I didn't even get a chance. Sister Van covered two topics last week, and I didn't even cover about half of one. But I'm just going to tell you, uh, I'm just going to tell you this. You can look it up for yourself. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 lets us know that Jesus Christ became our advocate and our propitiation. Yes. Advocate means he is our, like our lawyer. He stands before God because the Satan is the accuser of the brethren. When we do something wrong, I heard Minister Van today, Yes, Sonny, talk about how the devil come running into God. Look what they did. Look what they did. Look what they did. Because we do find ourselves guilty sometimes. But we got an advocate who is Jesus Christ and say, Father, is covered by the blood. I'll take care of that. And then the Bible says he is our perpetuation. The perpetuation means the sacrifice that satisfies God. The blood of bulls and goats and heifers did not change man, so it did not satisfy God. And then uh, Hebrews chapter 4 Verses 14 through 16 talks about how we have a great high priest. We don't have to worry about the high priest here on earth because we got a great high priest in heaven. And the Bible say he was tempted on all points such as we are without sin. And no matter what we go through, Jesus can identify with it. Somebody said nobody knows but Jesus. I can talk to Jesus, talk, tell him all about it because he understands. He walked in his flesh for these three and a half, 33 and a half years, as, as, as history say. He walked in this flesh, and he know what it is to be tempted. But he, he, he withdrew, he withheld in the midst of all the temptation, trials, and tests. And now he is our advocate. And the Bible says now we can go boldly because he can be touched with the feelings of our infirmity. He knows all about it. He know what we're going through. He know what we've been through. And he'll go through it with you. He won't leave you. He won't forsake you. Yes. Yes. 
so we can go boldly before the throne of grace. He is the mediator between God and man. We thank the Lord for all of you that are watching by Facebook, by YouTube. We hope you've learned something or received something from the message tonight. So be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Amen. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Evergreen Church, for being here. I get excited about the Word of God. You know, I, I get excited right by myself. I do. I do. E even when I, sometimes I be laying down and, and I can be riding along and my wife say, you preaching? Because she see me over there, I be just, yep, I be preaching. Amen. Um, I, I just love the Word of God. I love it when it comes from me and I love it when it comes from, 